it is a great pleasure for me to be with you once again, I must say, and to meet at least virtually so many friends and colleagues at the summit. My name is Thomas Seltner. I'm a Swiss uh, medical doctor and lawyer and have had the privilege to be involved in patient safety for many years, be it in Switzerland, be it uh, at the World Health Organization, and finally, and certainly not last but not least, at the patient safety movement with you. Very glad to be back uh, here with you today. I will be speaking uh, about the topic uh, that hold us hostage over the last two years. And unfortunately, I must say, probably even for uh, another couple of months, at least uh, the pandemic of the coronavirus. Let me start first by saying, uh, let's never forget how much suffering, long-term disease and death uh, this virus has brought our many of our families, communities and to the world. It is a painful moment for many, many of you probably on this uh, meeting. But let's also be thankful for all those who have committed their energy uh, and uh, all their work to fight against this virus. And uh, we all appreciate what that meant for all the healthcare workers, for their families, and we're so grateful for that. What I will do in the next minute is actually focus on something we're probably not even thinking too much about it, uh, namely the question, how much innovation has actually uh, this pandemic also created for our system locally, but also globally? And I will uh, address three issues uh, briefly, namely, uh, what innovations do I see that happened close to the patients and close to their families? Secondly, innovations uh, that happened in the political sphere to better fight the current pandemic. And finally, innovations to give the general population, uh, the public a possibility to, to engage uh, in creating a safer world. But before going into this, let me just mention uh, what challenges as a community, but also as government, and I worked a lot in this context with the Swiss governments, what challenges were we faced with? I think there were particularly five we need to look into. A, we were constantly in a race against the time, in a race against the virus, so speed of our action was always a very important uh, part of what we had to do. The second thing is, uh, how do we develop safe answers when we want to be fast, when we need to be fast? And so the question of speed versus safety has always been uh, at our mind. Thirdly, the question of solidarity, Global solidarity, overcoming global split is actually a, a very important issue. Uh, we saw the world actually split in two ways, West versus East, uh, the Western world uh, versus China to some extent, uh, but more importantly, and for today, the uh, split between the North and the South and the uh, those who have the means and those who didn't have them. A uh, forced, uh, we needed to collaborate uh, in this pandemic and we need to continue to do so. This is true, of course, for the medical field, but it is also between governments and the industry. It's uh, between uh, the industry and regulators. Uh, etc. So there is a lot of cooperation which is needed. And last point, a huge challenge is really the communication information 
in something we call the, the infodemic uh, that happened uh, in this pandemic. So let me first start with uh, the question of innovation close to patients and their families. And I will address uh, three points there. Of course, and we need to start with that, is really the question how much innovation went into producing a vaccine uh, in record times. Um, it is probably and uh, uh, really something we haven't seen uh, before and that we need to uh, appreciate even in the, in the future. Uh, let's rethink that you know, the, the virus showed up in December 2019 and already on uh, January 5th of uh, 2020, the Chinese and the Chinese uh, scientists actually published the genome of the virus. And 10, uh, on January 10, uh, already uh, it was on the, on the internet and everybody could uh, use this genome to work on vaccines. In the US, uh, Moderna, uh, with the support of uh, Fauci and the government, started working end of January on the vaccine. And uh, it took only a couple of months until the first vaccine was on the market. And uh, it's an amazing date, December 8th. The first person was vaccinated with a Pfizer vaccine, a 90-year-old uh, woman in the UK. Uh, December 14, uh, the first American was uh, vaccinated also. All these innovations and already the product per se and the technology used are huge innovations. But uh, we should not forget, and many people are not so much aware of that, two parallel innovations actually went along, uh, which are process innovations. For the first time, the companies with the support of the regulators actually didn't go through the regular process of clinical phase one, phase two, phase three in developing the vaccines, but actually had the uh, processes in parallel. So they were making actually phase two and phase three in parallel to save time. And the regulator accepted that as a procedure to speed up. The second thing uh, a number of companies did, and that's surprising too, they actually produced millions of doses of vaccine before uh, they had the license to do so uh, and the regulator's approval. Uh, just with the risk, if there was no approval, they would have had to dismiss it or to dump all these vaccines. But all of that helped that we were uh, on the market close to the patients with new vaccines very in a very short time. An amazing story of success and innovation. A second point I want to address, and again, not too many people are actually aware of that. WHO estimates that more than 1.3 million, 1.3 million people die every year because of unsafe uh, injection practices. Of course, most of these people live in, um, uh, in uh, in uh, high uh, low income countries in Africa, and uh, this makes that uh, uh, we need to invest in better injection uh, possibilities. And uh, again, here uh, we are doing new steps forward, which seem to be progressing rapidly. Uh, we have actually now one way syringes coming and even self-injecting syringes soon on the market also for the pandemic. The last one I want to address is quickly is really the question of um, uh, the IT digital technologies 
and the pandemic. Uh, telemedicine has seen a really push through the pandemic. And I think that is uh, something we really need to welcome. Uh, and I'm so glad that uh, that not only helps uh, when it comes interacting patients with uh, their uh, doctors, etc., but as a side effect, and that has a mental health effect, it helps uh, children to connect with other children and keep them uh, connected. And that all is actually very important. Next item I want to address is the question of uh, what innovations did we see in the political sphere? Uh, I just mentioned uh, three of them. Uh, one is, and the first one is the Act A initiative uh, generated by the um, G20 member states or members. And they actually promised in um, uh, early 2020 uh, that uh, they would collect the money, the resources needed to reach uh, something like 70% of vaccination co uh, coverage in low and middle income countries um, by September 22, to uh, testing rates of 100 by 100,000 inhabitants per day, uh, 120 million treatments uh, in low income countries and uh, protecting 2.7 million healthcare workers. These plans are fabulous. Unfortunately, and I only have the data till uh, February of this year, from the more than 16 billion uh, dollars uh, needed to fund this, on, uh, only 1.1 uh, uh, billion so far has been uh, sent and given, and we need to uh, rush and bring more money in. And I know that the countries are working on it, but we are far from then. So it's about let's uh, not only talk, but let's also walk the instrument, the innovation, the platform is here, but the results are not yet. The same is very much true for. Uh, the COVAX initiative, which is a platform organized by different uh, UN organizations. And uh, the idea behind COVAX is actually that doses for at least 20% of the population in a country are given through COVAX. So far, COVAX has actually shipped over 1 billion uh, doses to 144 countries. That's good, but is far from what we need. And I again see here uh, a couple of difficulties, um, namely that uh, high income countries are not as generous as they should be offering uh, the doses they could give to low income countries. Secondly, and that's the part we are working right now uh, low, in, low and middle income countries must better prepare uh, the vaccination campaigns. They are, many of them are just simply not ready to accept the dosages and to start with broad campaigns. And we need to innovate and help them innovate uh, also in that fund. And finally, and that's uh, unfortunately quite often the case in UN organizations, uh, uh, COVAX seems to be a very slow moving target on the organization. A last point on this innovation in the political sphere is uh, the Berlin hub uh, that uh, the WHO created uh, in order to have more data, better data, more and better analytics and better decisions when it comes to preparing for pandemics. Unfortunately, and that's surprising in the world we're living, the databases for 
um, the governments to prepare for pandemics, but also to fight the pandemics is uh, low. And, we, and the data are not actually secured. And we need to work on that. And we don't see uh, yet the results of this hub, but let's all work on this. Because it's a very important issue to be really science-based when it comes to response. This brings me to the last uh, of my points, and that's really the innovations we made or could make in the past months to enable the public to engage uh, in, in creating a safer world. Uh, one is that we created, and I was part of that, uh, funding campaigns to mobilize uh, campaigns to mobilize money for vaccination. One is the Go Give One campaign, which uh, actually asks individuals to give $7 for the vaccination or for vaccines. And the goal was to get 50 million people to uh, give $7. We are not yet there, but we did make major progress in collaborating actually with a fabulous organization, Global Citizens, which organized a couple of concerts, one of which uh, May 8, uh, where they actually helped uh, raising uh, more than $300 million uh, for COVID vaccines, which gives something like 20 million additional COVID, uh, vaccines. Many prominent people like Prince Harris and Meghan, um, other artists uh, have actually helped. And I think we are here seeing a new movement of supporting, which is fabulous. What we also saw, and we need to fight more, is uh, misinformation, fake news. And there, there is a very new initiative by the World Health Organization and the National Academy of Medicine in the US uh, to encourage a digital platform actually to apply principles for identifying credible sources of health. I would invite you all to look at this paper and to see how you can actually spread in your organizations the way how to uh, implement a more credible sources and get rid of fake news. And last but not least, let me uh, with some pride address the question of the WHO Foundation. We actually created this foundation in May 2020 because WHO lacks sufficient resources to fill its mandate. And uh, uh, what we want to do and uh, are about to do is really to invite philanthropists, foundation, business, and also individuals to support the mission of WHO, promote health, keep the world safe, and serve the most vulnerable. Right now, apart from the pandemic, we are also, of course, uh, trying to su uh, support uh, the people in the Ukraine, the health system in Ukraine, to uh, come uh, at grips with a very, very difficult situation they're in. Let me finish with coming back and with a very personal evaluation of the, how good we are with the challenges we said we uh, want to address. I think we can be happy and proud when it comes to the speed of our reaction. We have done well in that. Safety so far, as we can see it, patient safety has been up, except that some of the operations and other things had to be delayed, et cetera. But on a global level, we must say we are pretty good here. Uh, finally, the question of cooperation, so-so. Uh, information, I would say, 
there is much more to do. And unfortunately, once again, when it comes to solidarity, I would say we have not done the job and we need to do more. And uh, that's uh, uh, what I think we all need to work on in the next couple of months. Having said that, thank you so much for your attention. I hope that these couple of ideas brought you nevertheless a little bit how much also positive impacts uh, this pandemic had so far and that eventually we will come out of this pandemic also in that respect with some uh, positive new steps into a safer future. Thank you so much.